Almost there. No, I hate this game! Hey y'all, renowned video bastard Kbash here and the hour is upon us. Three souls games remaining, three shrieks yet unshruck. Oh, we're off to a good start. I recently covered the mainline Dark Souls games thanks to patrons, and they were fun. Worth exploring, because the design intentions informing the series paint a really stark picture of modern AAA gaming by comparison. Deliberately challenging what's in good taste, what you need to do at a baseline to sell a banger. Dark Souls looked around and said, less is more, play how you want, figure it out. I think that's the passive strength that Souls writ large conveys to people, how honest the experience is, how little embellishment or deceit obscures the play. It fumbles the bag in all kinds of little ways, but it gets people talking. Unsatisfied with that success, FromSoft pushed the boundaries of their own creation with a series of spin-offs. The gothic Bloodborne, the true ninja sim Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, and the epic fantasy Elden Ring. The bar for Souls games is high. Most people don't get super excited by Demon Souls except me, but DS1 is one of the most celebrated titles around, and different groups cling to 2 and 3. On the whole, the games are solid, especially with remastered versions on offer. And in spite of the pedigree, the spin-offs didn't fail like it all. Each of them strike out in new directions, contrary to the design constraints of the main games, and deliver. I like every game here. Whether that's a function of Stockholm Syndrome or not, hey, that's your call. So join me on this jolly jaunt through some video jays. I've been wandering, reflecting for a very long time, spirit. For what? For myself. And I got to thinking that I remember you. Oh, is that so? Your name. It's... Bloodborne's been sitting in my top 10 since I played it, but I'm not really sure why. It's one of the coolest things I've played. A lot of- Holy crap! Yeah, that. I love the aesthetic. I think it's an easier run than some of the main series titles, and its world feels juicier, more ripe than Dark Souls. Plus, it's just Ooh. disgusting. No, don't do that. And not to sound like a doofus, but I get some real Resident Evil 4 vibes playing it, even if it's a surface level comparison. And that's my favorite game, the most enjoyable, interesting, and tightly designed experience I can think of. Bloodborne really isn't that. It can't be. It's from the Souls lineage. You know, the series that'll let you wander off the path and die. The series that'll throw a level inappropriate enemy in the corner. The series that doesn't often account for every build. The series that lets players get in over their heads. It could never be RE4. That experience is razor sharp, forward flowing, and self-regulating in terms of difficulty. So how Bloodborne pull top 10? It's something like common wisdom in the Souls community that your first is your favorite. So let's interrogate that claim. Bloodborne was released between Dark Souls 2 and 3 at a time when Souls was inherently slow. No matter which of the early catalog you're playing, Demons 1 or 2, the games are all fairly sluggish, slug-like, slug-esque. It isn't until the third entry that the pace picks up and you struggle to land backstabs on basic nights. So even now, locked away on the PS4 and capped at 30 FPS on a good day, Bloodborne is exciting by comparison. The play is fast, anxious, risky, calculated, adjectives, it's fire. That's the only word I need. Just don't play it immediately after, like, Neo or something. It'll feel like molasses. It's usually placed really high or low on Souls difficulty tier lists. Nobody can really agree on the hardest Souls game. Even though Sekiro's the obvious answer to me, Bloodborne ranks near the top for others. Somehow. Seriously, guys, the circle button's right there. I talk pretty frequently about context for difficulty, because difficulty isn't experienced in a vacuum. What's hard for some instantly clicks for others, like with school subjects. Bloodborne is tough for some old fans, specifically because it throws out most of their learned behaviors and makes them dance. Those early games built a mindful, patient player who threw up a shield when in doubt and played safe otherwise. Dodge rolling was important, but it wasn't everything. Shoot, you could ignore dodge rolling with great shields, poise tanking, etc. Then Bloodborne sweeps in with a whole new combat system and mucks it all up. But before we dig into that, 
let's lay the base. Bloodborne takes place in a totally different universe than the Souls series. Even though there seems to be an implied connection to demon souls in the alpha version with Father Gascoigne using the religious word Umbasa, all ties were effectively severed in the final product. So we get Yarnum, a gothic megacity. Seriously, just look at the architecture. Currently suffering from a deadly epidemic, the Beast Plague, which drives men mad and even transforms them into murder machines. Swap the word plague for fog and that's basically the plot of Demon's Souls, except Bloodborne trades one king dealing with an elder god for a deeply corrupt set of institutions, mostly the healing church, that brought all this on the populace by taking the old blood, literally the blood of the elder gods, and using its restorative properties to perform miraculous healing via blood transfusion. That's gotta be at least one single yike. Right? So Eldritch Horror, you know, Innsmouth, Cthulhu, that whole aesthetic is seeded into the game. Regardless of your opinion on cosmic horror, it's a pretty big draw for nerds. And why not? It's a cool concept. The idea that entities literally beyond your human comprehension exist and will drive you insane to even gaze at is an interesting frame for horror. Hard to meaningfully imagine, so it manages to occupy the imagination. Bloodborne doesn't do a ton with the idea. Like, it doesn't push its mechanics to really sell that concept well, except for Insight and Frenzy. Not that the Cthulhu games were incredible at representing cosmic horror flawlessly either, and we'll get into it later, but suffice it to say that the aesthetics function as table dressing, and really I don't think you could sell a Souls game, a build-based power fantasy, with cosmic horror anyhow. If you get into combat in the Call of Cthulhu RPG, you're probably dead, but it's worth making a note regardless. You play as a hunter, a skirmisher, stripped of armor and shield, and armed with brutal, mechanical weapons that transform to accommodate evolving combat situations. As the beasts of the world became swifter and more deadly to immobile knights, speed and utility became the weapons of choice. That's right, you can smash through clay pots slightly more efficiently than usual. Okay, I know that's a minor point, but just just give it to me. A lot of thought and effort has been channeled into Bloodborne to meaningfully differentiate it from the Souls games, justify those decisions in-universe, and provide a pull for newcomers who might have skipped over the other titles for fear they were too hard or looked too boring. You're not just a stock fantasy knight, but a guy in coat. Everyone loves guys with coats. Here's some famous men in coats. I rest my case. It's hard not to appreciate, and the cosmic horror conceit aids all this by slowly unveiling itself to the player during a playthrough, and building a heightening internal drama. Can the lowly Copeman kill God? The other Souls games have heightening stakes as well. Players go from rooting out small-time scourges to killing living legends. That isn't new. But the way Bloodborne sells its rising stakes is much more impactful as the player grapples with beings and forces beyond their understanding. Let's take a walk through the intro. You wake up, receive blood ministration by a strange man, wander through a spooky clinic, and die in a fight with a beast. That takes all of five minutes, in contrast with earlier titles, and sees you off to the Hunter's Dream where you'll have your choice of starting weaponry. Oh, and creep from the opening cutscenes there in the house, talking about use the dole out front if it pleases you. Get me the f*** out of here. You've been chosen as a hunter. Your purpose is to kill beasts. Garmin here tells you himself, go out and kill. Dying will shunt you back to the Hunter's Dream, so you're trapped in a never-ending cycle of waking into a nightmare. So get killing. Bloodborne doesn't opt for a slower paced tutorial segment, something the Souls games traditionally used. Instead, you pop into Central Yarnum, kill some guys, climb a ladder, hear a horrible roar off in the distance. Yeah, yeah, pipe down, I'm coming. And that's it. That's the extent of the tutorial. You've got a whole sprawling level, an optional boss, and a story boss standing between you and the game given right to level up. And don't worry, it's at least as hard as the undead bird. For a spin-off with new mechanics, that's bold. That's a cup of dark roast, son. There's an argument that Bloodborne uses its opening level as a raw player filter. Sure, we could call the whole thing a tutorial, but it's nowhere near the triviality of the other titles. Demons gave you little head pats all the way through and then whomped your ass. One was pretty tame all around, Ass Whomper notwithstanding, Bloodborne won't even let you grind your way to victory if you're stuck on the Cleric Beast. Or, because it's an optional boss, Gascoigne, who requires the player learn how to parry. It's learn or return. Hope you kept your receipt. 
fine. Now normally that'd bother me a bit, but I think it's worth the time spent grappling with mechanics. Bloodborne was my first Souls game, and it took anywhere from four to six hours for the game to click. It didn't come easy, but I was playing Final Fantasy XV concurrently at the time, and basically put that game down and never went back. In any case, I think Bloodborne pays off harder than most Souls games do, all while funneling players through a concise experience that mostly accounts for build diversity while maintaining the integrity and value of its new systems. It's a Souls game. Garriman told me it's a Souls game by contextualizing the gameplay as something I'll enjoy doing, regardless of the running narrative. So let's focus on the game for now. Some elements of the Souls design lineage are left mostly unchanged. The world takes cues from Dark Souls 1 being largely interconnected and often in surprising ways. Lore and world building take a seat ahead of story, as per usual, and the few NPCs you meet are either untrustworthy or ill-fated, without much wiggle room. Oh hey, there's a safe house! A cathedral where you can gather up survivors and make them your pals! Sure hope there's no Demon Souls ass psychopaths around here. And like Dark Souls, no matter how the weapons have changed, you're incentivized to be an L1 spamming machine, slapping monsters and dashing around. You still drop your souls, renamed Blood Echoes, on death, and lose them permanently if you fail to reach them before dying again. You channel Blood Echoes into yourself to level up, a stat spread, and upgrade your weapons to increase your power. That's all familiar. That's Souls. I'll just shut your ass. Oh yeah, that's Dark Souls. Even though the infrastructure is recognizable, small changes, shifts, and notches warp the experience into something bizarre, and even intoxicating to play. And that's the point of the changes. A light ludonarrative harmony crops up in the combat. The player, a hunter who's received blood ministration and carries the beast plague, is incentivized to act bestial. This is justified in the lore, but mechanically you're rewarded for giving into impulse and acting on instinct. Instinct, in this case, being represented in the hastened and lengthened quick step and dodge roll, and the back step option, you're handed a series of upgraded mobility tools to compensate for a lack of useful shields, and due to the lengthened invincibility time and general rewards for aggression, you're even incentivized to dodge into oncoming attacks to beat the hitbox and keep combat flowing. Giving into impulse is represented in the rally mechanic. Basically, if you take damage, you'll be able to recoup some of it by striking your enemy in a small time frame. You're actively rewarded for giving in to base urges and punishing your enemy. That's such an enormous change, just emotionally, and it's exclusive to Bloodborne. In the old games, getting impatient and going for revenge hits on any challenging enemy would cost you your life, more often than not. Bloodborne wants you seeing red. To a point, anyway, healing with rally can't account for quality play. And in that sense, Bloodborne is simply more forgiving than Dark Souls. No shields, but better dodges. Free heals. It's like the millennials are all out here getting freebies, man. The genius of combat is its consistency. There are all kinds of enemies in this game, but they blend into a slurry in your advanced of death. Not to be needlessly poetic, Sekiro's combat is often referred to as a dance, but Bloodborne really captures the concept best, I find, as you weave in and out of enemy attacks, change rhythm with the various types of enemies, but never really stop moving. Maybe only to fire off a bullet on occasion or charge an attack. Enemies are all aggressive and highly lethal. Several will grab you and deal fatal damage if you're not topped off, and your defensive options are so limited, those options mostly being mobility related, that combat physically flows much more than the other Souls games, and more organically reflects the dance concept. And you know what? Thank God for Bloodborne figuring out that the Souls parry sucks. I'm sorry, the microfraction of the fanbase that actually made regular use of the system should be indicative enough, right? The games don't do well with parry. Lots of other games make use of audio and visual cues, and in Dark Souls you're mostly going by eye. But Bloodborne has mobile warriors and is vaguely Victorian. Enter the gun, a long-ranged parry tool held in the offhand. Not every attack is parryable, like before, but at least you can leave some space and experiment at will. And it's tied to a consumable resource bullets, so even though it's safer and more powerful in general, it's not totally abusable. I think the gun might be the smartest combat innovation in the Souls series, and it's exclusive to Bloodborne. Love that. Means I can keep saying Bloodborne is genius. You might imagine a speedy character like the Hunter would be capable of sneaking, but not really. I mean, most enemies are placed to see you in seconds, though the game will sometimes throw you a bone and reward a sneaky player. Shh, 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 shut the fuck up, shut the fuck up. I'm gonna sneak up and stab him to death with my weapon. Hey, happy birthday!
Yeah. While backstabs functionally exist, they're much harder to land in general, requiring a charged attack at an enemy's back. Several enemies can be crumpled through this back attack method, damage, and other means, screenlighting the visceral attack, an execution style invincible health walloper. And I gotta tell you, paired with the rally mechanic, it goes from satisfaction to nut bust in a second. Speaking of victory, the game makes use of Demon Souls ass healing in the form of a consumable, blood vials, which function like standardized Demon Souls grass, and you can hold up to 20. The system's divisive because it's great, but it sucks. I mean, I love it because it means I can brute force boss fights with 20 vials if I'm really not playing my best, but the issue is forcing players to grind when they're out. Just running around the town, harvesting blood. I'm a hero, I promise. It's easy to miss the reliability of the Estus Flask regardless. Thankfully, you can buy blood vials, and indeed, every time I kill a boss and level up, I dump the rest of my echoes into healing items, so the game has smoothing options for the grind, and especially for a good player. Meanwhile, beginners are getting free attack heals and fewer options to worry about in combat. Just keep focused, keep dashing, hug ass, and smack. If beginners are being made to grind, they're being put back out into the world they clearly haven't mastered yet, and that's not the worst punishment. I mentioned that the map of Bloodborne isn't much different than Dark Souls, and that's mostly accurate. Many of the areas you're meant to complete in sequence are either contiguous with one another, or are accessed via routes established early enough in the game that they should be known to the player. And like Dark Souls, you're free to complete several areas out of strict order, allowing you to fight certain bosses early and even change the fate of some NPCs. Like Jura here, the hunter manning the Gatling gun in Old Yarnum. I was looking for secrets. Normally you'd enter the zone, be told to back off, go along anyway, get shot at, climb up to Jura's perch and fight him face to face. It's easiest to whip out your pistol and let him have it. Yeah, that's why they call me Quick Draw McGraw. But you can actually befriend Jura by getting killed by one of these bagmen, taken to Yahargul, killing a boss, and working your way through the level backwards, basically. Now, on account of my name's Quick Draw McGraw, I have never bothered with that kind of thing, but it's pretty impressive to allow and account for a sequence to play out in multiple ways. Even accessing Yahargul by dying is, like, ambrosially incredible. Bloodborne isn't a game I find scary, but it definitely makes use of many kinds of horror. Teleporting an unsuspecting player to another zone entirely, possibly one that's level inappropriate and dimly lit in general, is such an awe-inspiring prank. It's a game that lets players get lost in the hunt for answers, for power, for secrets. It's an enthralling thing to experience the first time, and absolutely the first game I'd wipe all memory of for another shot of that intrigue. The levels aren't all killer, though, to be clear. Central Yarnum is great for its introductory status, tight encounters, general verticality. Like I said in the first video, Dark Souls' first levels are fun. Old Yarnum is enjoyable despite its linearity, especially because the Gatling gun fire keeps the player frantic throughout. Hemwick Chapel Lane is interesting for similar reasons to the intro level. It's smaller, but several whens and ways exist that make it feel discoverable, even if it's relatively small. Otherwise, most levels are too tiny to be worth discussion. Bergenworth is a small place with a building. The lecture hall is cool, but serves as a light antechamber between zones. The Nightmare Frontier can piss off. Yahargul and the responding enemies and laser blasts can piss off. Kanehurst and the blood lickers can piss off. It's so much easier to remember levels as that annoying one with that dumb bullshit. Uh, not a great sell. TBH. Yahar Ghoul is doable, but it's a fairly stiff challenge at a point where the player's build really starts to matter, and it's a little more tense than most of the game. The Nightmare Frontier is just frustrating, with multiple hazards that impede player mobility, so so many traps and obstacles and poison, because why not add poison and the first Winter Lantern? Let me ask you something. You want to simulate cosmic horror insanity in a video game. Would you include a mechanic that, in short, has a bar fill up rapidly within range of an insanity-inducing enemy that causes an instant 70% damage when the bar fills up, and the only way to meaningfully combat the effect is killing the enemy? Okay, okay. I'll just tuck that away for later. 
I'm keeping score, you know. Bloodborne can be a frustrating experience, especially around the mid-game as builds start to coalesce, the world begins to open up, and all the weird individual level gimmicks and frustrations become apparent in rapid succession. I've always had the best time in the beginning when the challenge is vanilla, and near the end when the player's build is truly online. I would never call Bloodborne a bad time, but games got grime. Of course, those bumps make the journey memorable, and if it were smooth the whole way, it'd pass you by, you know? in and out in seconds. Like my fist in this pig's ass! Make sure to get your rectum inspected! This is not a joke. And how you engage with the world, the gameplay, the combat is similar to any other Souls game with your build. Weapons are everything in Bloodborne, I'd argue, and it's because of what they imply about the game and how they diverge from traditional Souls weapons. While options are limited, at least compared to the absolute deluge of sharp crap in Dark Souls, the player is presented with a select series of meaningful and viable choices, without having to worry about the finer details differentiating a Claymore and a Zweihander, a longsword and a night sword. If you pick the Chikage, the lone katana in the game, you've got the best katana in the game. While old Souls weapons could be double-handed, opening up additional moves, they were all fundamentally themselves. A halberd held in two hands might gain thrusting attacks and be more useful in corridors, but it's still a halberd. Bloodborne, conversely, took advantage of steampunk-esque mechanical designs that could change shape to function like the soul's halberd we just looked at, or get a little silly. And really, we could all benefit from getting a little silly. Some weapons get buffed, like the Chikage, a weapon that, on transformation, becomes coated with blood and deals piles of damage at the cost of the wielder's health. Some weapons become other weapons, like the Holy Moonlight Sword becoming the Moonlight Greatsword, or the Whirligig Saw, which starts as a cudgel and becomes a gigantic Beyblade on a stick. Damn, Bloodborne kind of Beyblade coated, huh? They range from bizarre to magical to totally mundane. The Hunter's Cleaver just swings out, increasing its range. Several don't shift dramatically in case you want your weapons to feel more Souls-like low-key, but the allure of the hyper-stylish arms is hard to resist. It's part of Bloodborne's strategy. Looking cool is more important than being super innovative, and I respect that immensely. If you're gonna get the long coat, might as well drip up your arsenal too. In a series that was already getting mildly tired, looking fresh and fun is the right play. It's important to mention that upgrade materials are fairly limited. In the base game, you can only find a single Blood Rock, the strongest upgrade material, once per playthrough, and a second if you've got DLC access, so the player is funneled into one or two weapons to really invest in over the course of a run. And that's not unheard of for Souls, but being strictly limited to an extremely cool weapon of choice on a character that's dripping with gothic flair elevates the aesthetics of the build to heights yet unmatched for the series, at least in Demons to 2. 3 may have challenged Bloodborne's claim to cool with its weapon arts, but Bloodborne's unique visuals keep it in the running regardless. That's one of Bloodborne's best qualities the build and how it relates to the playthrough. Like any Souls game, you'll hoard stats into a few areas of interest. You've got vitality, endurance, strength, skill, or some say dexterity, blood tinge, and arcane. Every stat not related to hit points or stamina pumps the damage of this or that weapon. Blood tinge sounds weird, but it mostly buffs guns and blood weapons. If you stick to health and a couple of damage stats, you're set. You can even safely ignore stamina for the most part. I have in every playthrough. The game actually gives you enough at a baseline to function. It's incredible. Finding a build is more about finding a weapon you like and pumping its stats. The Chikage needs skill and blood tinge? Done. Easy. The Whirligig Saw needs strength? Easy. It's so easy! Simplified, focused, interesting. Bloodborne is an experiment in compressing the multitudinous options of the Souls games and churning out diamonds. You don't have every option on a single playthrough, but that only makes it more exciting to jump back in. It's one of the few games I felt compelled to run on New Game Plus. One of the few games I found worth more than a few runs. In the past, I ran with the Claymore, Ludwig's Holy Blade, and it carved up the game like nothing. Finding the Chikage, though, I mean, I couldn't not run through again with a blood katana. Man, what do I look like, an animal? So I went back. I've run with the Moonlight Greatsword and the Rikuyo. This game has always felt sharp, responsive, exciting, even focusing on a single weapon per run. It's never gotten stale. This run, I decided to challenge myself with something I'd never used, the Beast Cutter. Basically the strength version of the Threaded Cane's starting weapon. It's fairly slow and unwieldy, hard to recommend. In fact, I dropped it entirely for the Whirligig Saw by the very end, but set that aside for a second. Like all Souls games, your weapon of choice dictates your play 
playthrough. Using the Beast Cutter, I had bad rally healing. The weapon just isn't good at it, regardless of slow swing speed. It can outrange most enemies and flatten enemy hunters. That's its strength. But it's hard to justify a slow zoning weapon in an aggressive game. You will get swarmed and you will take hits for screwing around, even a little with the whip version. I loaded up with strength to make the most of the thing, but even though I was unsatisfied with the weapon, I could have dove out any time for the Hunter's Cleaver or Ludwig's Holy Blade. Though the game has limited options, there's almost always another option to salvage a rough run, and enough drip to salvage a terrible bore. What Bloodborne has over over its predecessors is time. It's a short run, something like 10 hours if you know where to go and don't trip up too often. That and it tends to be easier than other games. That's fascinating for a Souls game. While you can speedrun through the lineage, the average player will often run up the clock, stumbling around through areas, collecting things, backtracking, etc. But between Bloodborne's fast travel, knowledge, and build focus, it's easy to sit down and pull another run. With arguably mediocre levels in some, okay I like a lot of them but let's be honest, the player is incentivized to blaze through and put down the bosses. It's like the game flips a switch and turns into a boss rush on New Game Plus. It's genuinely impressive how differently playthroughs can turn out. So many bosses are outright optional. So many areas can be ignored, and the bosses feel more like notches in your belt than trophies on the wall. I go as far as saying that very few of them matter from a design perspective. Just occupying the biggest yeah. hole of the area chair until you come along and knock it off. The Cleric Beast is an optional, but stiff early challenge that encourages experimentation with items and unlike several bosses can be stunned with gunshots aimed at the head, opening up visceral attacks. It's weirdly experimental in a way that most other bosses aren't, if only by virtue of the player's coalesced build, overshadowing item tricks and headshot gimmicks later on. Gascoigne would be worth commentary, but he's explicitly designed to check Perry's skill, though he has narrative value for showing what hunters drunk with blood and succumbing to the plague can become. The blood-starved beast is an obnoxious enemy that flings itself all over the arena while spreading poison. Alongside Vicar Amelia and her occasional healing, several bosses only really have one or two gimmicks beyond, you know, swipe swipe bite. Some bosses feel incomplete or serve as fakeouts. The Celestial Emissary and the DLC's Living Failures, both weak bosses heading up much more powerful enemies. Pour one out for the players who lantered home after the emissaries and never jumped through the nearby window. The camera isn't the worst in this entry, but it's got issues. The amygdala fight has our disgusting friend lift his hands out of the camera's view, making it frustrating to see attacks coming. Even Dark Beast Parl can run into this issue with his enormous, highly mobile body constantly playing with the player's vision. The game makes use of a few minion bosses, the kind maybe inspired by Dark Souls 2. The Witch of Hemwick feels kind of like a gimme. Its minions are frustrating, but the witch's health is so low, it's hard to complain. And Rom may be one of the most annoying fights, if only because patience is the only clear path to victory, either by clearing out every spider, god forbid, or weaving between spiderlings to slash at the real enemy, to say nothing of the immensely damaging magical attacks. Other bosses feel close, but not quite good enough for a game as storied and well-reviewed as Bloodborne. The One Reborn is actually fairly inoffensive. It's possible to switch off your brain and run him down to Unga Town, but realizing that the arena is lined with projectile spammers you should clear out complicates things. Even worse is Viscera Rain ability and vomit just don't visually convey how lethal they are. The Viscera Rain, because it strikes three times without much fanfare. I mean, it's hard enough to even register the attack in the chaos, setting aside having to figure out that it strikes three times with no indication. And the Vomit actually damages the player before it's fully materialized on screen, which is just infuriating. Plus, it's gigantic. You're absolutely swimming in puke by the time you're in trouble. Special shout out to Mikalash here for running between rooms and requiring a good amount of footwork to hunt down. It's not an exciting fight, and he deals extreme damage, making the battle tense, but fairly tedious. Same goes for Murgo, having an extended period of invulnerability that's also highly lethal. Not a fan, but the fight is easy enough. The fights I tend to like come from the later bosses, DLC fights included, but not all. My favorite nowadays may well be the Shadows of Yarnum, a three-man fight, each opponent equipped with a different moveset. It takes full advantage of Bloodborne's general mobility and rewards the player for learning to parry, but not as 
freely as Gascoigne, meaning the player has to actually embody what the combat is teaching to pull through. Otherwise, Ebritus, Martyr Lagarius, German, Lawrence, Ludwig, Maria, and the Orphan of Kos are incredible battles. Each of them feature high damage, a mix of range-based and melee threats, require the player to stay active, occasionally ask the player to switch up their style mid-battle, usually evolve themselves in fantastical, eye-catching ways that keep the blood pumping. And that's everything in a game like Bloodborne, where the levels are hit or miss, where some of the bosses are memes, where the game can drag at times, and the thing keeping you moving is the promise of power, and looking really badass getting it. These fights feel like accomplishments, even in the late game. I'm going to exclude discussion of the DLC as gameplay. It basically functions as an amalgam of previously used areas, at least until the final stretch, and it's highly challenging overall, but it won't fully stop a dedicated player from running all the way through. In short, Short, it's perfect for souls, giving the player an incredible environment and letting them choose to engage how they want. What the bosses do well, in harmony with the levels and mechanics, is tell an escalating tale of doom filtered through the lens of cosmic horror. Things start small. You're a person with a purpose, killing beasts, and you strike down a series of increasingly powerful monsters, including one of your own kind, someone like you, until you reach the Grand Cathedral and put down a clergy member, Vicar Amelia. This is the first point of no return, and the player is turned loose in Yarnum again as night falls over the city. Things are colder, enemies are more dangerous, and all the while you're gaining insight. This little number that you can spend for gear and stuff, whatever, but more importantly, changes the world itself. See, occasionally you come across spooky things, like a giant door that can't be opened as- WHAT THE F*** Whoa! IS THAT?! WHAT THE F*** and after killing Rom the vacuous spider, hidden in the lake at Bergenworth, the blood moon rises, changing the world once again. Eventually, you'll have 50 insight, deepening the move pools of certain enemies and revealing that this whole time you've been watched by these massive, horrible creatures, the amygdala. Bloodborne is not a scary game the way that Resident Evil 7 maybe is. It doesn't often use jump scares, though I think Yosefka's clinic is pretty spooky. But what it does do is reveal things to the player, hidden right under their nose. And all of that is served incredibly well by soul storytelling. The way information is denied to the player and trickled in through item descriptions and untrustworthy NPC dialogue. Bloodborne might not blow your mind, but it does things with its own internal information economy that really fires the imagination, really tunes players into the universe. It builds this escalation of terror so thoroughly too. Take old Yarnum and the Gatling Gun, the one major environment environmental hindrance in the zones and how it parallels with the late game Brain of Mensis, which frenzies you at range without you ever being struck by something so mundane as a bullet. Just an eerie glow and drone, an unstoppable status ailment. Cosmic horror might not affect the player character, you're never truly rendered useless or bereft of sanity, but the player is exposed to vastly deepening threats and stakes in a way that strikes similar notes. It's an extremely intelligent game, and that's to say nothing of the in-game side quests, the ambient moments that create stark little personal memories with each player, the secret areas you can stumble into, the chalice dungeons, just a swath of free, procedurally generated dungeons to run. It really is the Souls game that keeps giving. I think Elden Ring's the only real comparison. Bloodborne's endings have been discussed to death, but I love that it mixes the vile and esoteric to truly transcend humanity. If you complete the game doing nothing extra, you wake up unsure of whether you've woken into a new dream or to reality. In either case, it's a conclusion. The second ending simply has the player replacing Gehrman as the Watcher of Dreams, meaning that while you're effectively retired, your work is never ending and the cycle continues ad nauseum. But, if you find and consume three-thirds of an umbilical cord over the course of the game, generally found on the corpses of women who've birthed an infant Great One, you can fight an extra boss and become an infant Great One yourself. Yes, you're turned into a wriggling slug beast, but you're given the chance to evolve past humanity, ascend to a higher consciousness, become one with the universe, and in a world like Bloodborne's that unenthusiastically reflects the real world and the power structures that inform it, the social strata that rise out of it, and the pain inflicted because of it, rising above base humanity is a kingly reward for the player. So yeah, outside of some annoying design stuff, I guess I figured out why I like Bloodborne. It's the coats! It was the coats all along! Coatborne 2022! Coatborne forever! Your name. It's Xbox, isn't it? <laughs> well deduced, but irrelevant. So show your true form then. COWARD! 
Yes, I am your dark half, Xbox. Okay, let me stop you right there. I disavow all of this sh this cringy gamer trope nonsense. Ridiculous. That's your weakness, talking. You know that to truly defeat me, you must become me. Do not reject the part of you that is cringe. Embrace it and descend. Sekiro, a review in two acts. Bro, check out this sweet ninja game. They went and turned souls into a ninja suit. That's amazing. This is unreal. The movement's totally open. You can jump, you can grapple, you can do so much. Oh my God. It's nothing like Ninja Gaiden and I love me some Ninja Gaiden, but the scope, the vision, bro. Okay, this is actually kind of hard. No big deal, it's a Souls game, but they're all hard. Like, two was full of weird little moments, and one was rough at first, so whatever. <laughs> to be honest, this is pretty fu- I'm not really sure Sekiro should- Seriously, what in the f- I'm sorry, Dragon Rot? You're punishing the NPCs with disease because I died too much? Excuse me? I'm sorry, you lose half your money on death? I'm sorry, is this Yippee! Earthbound? You what? You lose half your experience too? Are you kidding me? Oh, that camera hit different. I love highly mobile ninjas in my soul's framework. Oh, yes. Hit me with another phase of this boss fight. Give him the full health bar. Oh, I love it so. I can't. I can't. It's impossible. The game is impossible. It's impossible. <laughs> Thank you for attending the dramatic recreation of my first playthrough. The sweat's still on my face. Unfortunately, it's free of tears and therefore not accurate to the original experience. Hey y'all, renowned video person Kbash here, coming at you fresh off a new game plus playthrough. And let me just say, Sekiro, good. Huh? Yes, I do have over 40 hours played and it took the first run to start having fun regularly. No, that isn't Stockholm Syndrome. Don't dive store shrink me. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is the first FromSoft title post Dark Souls 3. It's experimental in a way that makes Bloodborne look boilerplate and mounts the stiffest challenge from the studio, period. I had to beat it twice to look at it clearly, and that's a hard sell. I think it skates by on presentation because the actual meat is extremely tough. It takes turning your head into a tenderizer to make the thing palatable. Unless you like your sh yeah. well done, you know. It reminds me of games like Ninja Gaiden Black and Beautiful Joe and Bayonetta 1 in that way. Games that'll kick you up and down the neighborhood while you try desperately to have fun eating gravel. So to be clear, there's a precedent for this kind of experience. I don't hate the thing at all, but it's a disclaimer first kind of game. And unlike those games, Sekiro is 30 to 40 hours on a first run because it's just that hard. It's really no longer than Bloodborne when you know what you're doing, but the skills don't come cheap. Time is money, friend. Now you all know I played the game subbed, but let's get a clip of the dub. My name is Kyobu Masataka Oniwa! Jesus Christ, I think all the corpses of the earth heard that. Sekiro is set in a fantastical Japan, one with direct references to history. It takes place during the Sengoku period specifically, but it incorporates magic, spirits, legends, and folklore, all kinds of things, to produce a deeply cultural work that's alluring, but hard to comment on without the proper experience. Regardless, you wake up in a well as Sekiro, a shinobi in service to the divine heir, Kuro. Sekiro's life leading up to this point was fairly brutal. He was a war orphan raised by another shinobi and both lost an arm and died in combat with Genichiro Ashina, head of the Ashina clan who killed Sekiro to abduct Kuro to use the child's gift of immortality, a magic passed through his bloodline to become powerful and save Japan. Sekiro awakens because he serves Kuro and therefore has the gift of immortality himself and a whole bunch of other stuff gets revealed that led up to this exact moment but to be clear, the point here isn't that the story exists but that its contents are directly relevant to the player. It's the first major departure, setting the stage and telling a story in a way that the other games don't. You're not beholden to anyone in the other Souls games, not in the way that Sekiro is beholden to his young master and his father. And you learn really quickly that this is for sure not Dark Souls. You're made to jump, sneak past guards, and climb right out the gate. Once you've got your sword, the game starts for real. While the tutorial is easy enough, the challenge ramps up significantly afterwards. So for newcomers and old heads, what about Sekiro is still Souls? Like any other title in the main lineup, 
Life is cheap and death is part of the game. You die all the time and they plan for it, allowing the player to resurrect after death once and later more frequently. It would be a smoothing mechanic and an understandable choice given how strict the combat can be, but a full resurrection doesn't mean a whole lot when damage is so high, when bosses often have more than one life themselves, and when you're faced with any given challenge that's necessary but not quite doable without banging your head off the thing until your brain's totally remodeled. The resurrection is framed like a ninja trick. Pop back up and surprise your enemies with a backstab, but in practice the AI either lingers around a little too long, there's too many enemies in general to greenlight a stealth strike, or it's a boss and they know you're getting up. It doesn't function as advertised nearly often enough. And worse than that, the punishment for true death is harder than any other Souls game. Losing money is something I can handle. I played a dungeon crawler or two. I live in a society. And you can bank your gold in coin pouches if you know where the merchants are. But losing a crude experience, even if it doesn't ever chunk off whole skill points, is fairly demented. Fairly f yeah. demented. I don't see death in a game with a thousand fresh threats as something narratively indicative of Sekiro losing his skills. So it amounts to a massive feels bad in general. Unless you're willing to bank your skills ASAP into crappy little abilities instead of saving up. It's frustrating to grapple with as a newcomer. But K-Bash, sometimes the gods will throw you a bone and not penalize you as hard. Ha, that's true. Thanks for the sweet die roll to alleviate my pain. F so, life is cheap, but more than that, the player's time is cheap, unless they're willing to dedicate their life to becoming a ninja master. I get it, Miyazaki, you like to play Ness. NPCs are mostly the same as other Souls games. It's hard to know who's trustworthy, and their side quests are all easily missed. No different than other Souls games. But I thought it was weird how similar they felt to Dark Souls in general, where you might complete one leg of a quest, then miss a step and never see the character again. Weird because the game cares about story. But it definitely worked in other entries, so who's to say if it's questionable or not? I'm not being salty. I'm just saying it's weird, okay? It's it's weird that- The basic gameplay is obviously warped out of control as well, but you're still mostly stuck spamming L1 between parries and other junk. Your light attack, your frame data, is still king. Setting aside that light similarity, bosses are just as punishing as ever. More so even. More than that even. They're f***ing brutal. I have no idea how I beat this game. I have no idea how I beat this twice. I have no idea how my friends beat this. How the f*** y'all beat this? Lastly, the build concept is different, but intact. Though every Sekiro is equipped with the same sword, individual players will build different skill trees that rely on different shinobi prosthetics. Critically, the game allows players to personalize. That's my ticket in. These elements are good. It makes sense to keep the front-facing identity of souls. Players will still ask each other what setup they used. Challenge runs are possible with no skills or prosthetics, and the bosses all induce groans and laughs and flashbacks between players. It's a Souls game. And yet, despite efforts to keep the experience familiar, Sekiro is radically different in so many ways. It's the closest thing to a character action game that FromSoft ever produced. It wants you to master a complex gameplay system. You aren't handed all possible combat options up front. You're meant to play through multiple times, and style is king, even if efficiency just happens to look stylish in Sekiro. It's hard to stick it in that lineage, mostly because the RPG baggage attached keeps it slightly out of the category, but I'm not super pressed about genre in the first place. Sekiro is at least split between action and souls. So ninja combat. Dark Souls was always about patience, and Bloodborne freed the system up a bit by encouraging aggression. Sekiro feels bizarre because it walks a really tight line between passivity and hard aggro. Imagine me stocking the freshly ordered garlic pickle pizza at the family gathering, but not wanting to look desperate. It's enticing, but deeply treacherous. You can kill almost any small enemy with a single strike if you catch them unawares, but otherwise the wolf is fairly weak in combat, relegated to light sword slashes, the occasional charge attack, parries, and dodges. Most enemies block regularly, so you're not able to casually L1 spam everything to death, but that doesn't mean spamming light attacks is worthless. Combat with any enemy hinges on the posture bar which every character has. It signifies how exhausted a character is becoming in combat. If it fills up or breaks, the character is 
is prone to a death blow. So combat generally revolves around filling up enemy posture bars and one-shotting them rather than dealing enough damage. Though you absolutely can chip away at an enemy's health and hit them with a coup de grace. Notably, attacks steal health bar and posture bar damage, and being low on health lowers the capacity for the posture bar to refill. So you can whittle enemies away, staying aggressive with light attacks as compounding benefits in combat, which is why the light attack isn't worthless in a game based on death blows. I think it's pretty clever. It's worth mentioning here that you can recover your own posture bar by guarding, which is why I say that passivity over raw aggression is important to the game. Parries are the real game, though. Almost every enemy attack in the game can be parried, and parries deal piles of posture damage. It's hard to learn, even though the parry window is fairly forgiving, because the game is quick, and so many enemies have different parry timings. Regardless, it's tempting to parry everything and deal a death blow to anything you come across, but anyone who's played for any real length of time should realize that it's the blending of active defense and mindful aggression that carves through the game fastest. Regardless of all my gamer gripes, Sekiro is responsive, sharp and impactful, fun to play and intoxicating to master. Should have played this yeah. 60 FPS though. What's interesting is how mobility factors into the experience. You're allowed to free run mid combat. You can jump and pull off all kinds of maneuvers regardless of whatever's going on on the ground. You can just choose to escape combat if you want. The player is given so much mobility that the game feels amazing to simply move through. The guy is fast and grapples all kinds of things with a button. It's so freeing, but combat is interesting for putting a halt on most of that freedom. No matter how you slice it, it's hard to stay crazy mobile while you're fishing for parries. I still find myself running around, dashing, jumping on occasion, but there isn't much value to randomly jumping. And this is a game that removed stamina entirely. You might think that with iframes on dodges, combat would be horrendously skewed in the player's favor, but the iframes are slim and enemies are too aggressive, too fast to perfectly weave between and keep on top of damage. And that's why I reject the dance idea the combat is sometimes sold with. It's a little too frenetic and most most of the emphasis is on parries. Because of that, others have called it a rhythm game, which checks out to a degree. It's a rhythm game if rhythm games often change tempo at the drop of a hat and you're assailed with micro rhythms constantly. And honestly, if we're being really honest, the combat is bop it. It's high stakes kill murder bop it. That's not even close to a joke or exaggeration, by the way. The core combat revolves around what I've already mentioned, light attacks and parrying in time, but then the game adds sweeping attacks and stabs into the mix, requiring the player to, with a low grade skill, tap the B button in time to counter a thrust or to jump an incoming sweep and punish with an attack. These are reactive, hard hit encounters that wreck enemy posture. The game is literally bop it, and I think that makes it fun, but extremely annoying when you fail because the answers every player needs are immediately accessible, but but in the heat of the moment end up feeling exactly like bad quick time events when you're trying to learn. That's my major shrieking point. Bloodborne, Dark Souls, whatever the devs were reacting to with this setup wasn't broken. You never really had to parry in Bloodborne except arguably with Gascoigne. You could use the very basics to scrape by, but Sekiro demands a lot while punching the player in the groin for daring to try learning. So it's an experience for the repeat players, true gamers, or like I posited in the first video, people willing to get online and get mean. You're a ninja, so why should you have to play fair? I've only really described the absolute basics of Sekiro. There's so much to learn. For example, the Makiri counter, the thrust counter that is, hardly needs to be timed at all and can be mashed furiously, which yes, will send you dashing into an enemy, but will still give you the counter. Jumping a low attack is pretty loose as well. Precision is only really necessary for parries. The build is where the gameplay experience diverges for players. First is the Shinobi prosthetic. It's your offhand combat tool and can be fitted to cover multiple situations and counter specific enemies. If you're facing a frequent jumper, the shuriken attachment will stuff it on reaction. If you're facing a shield, the axe will reduce it to kindling. And a lot of hidden upgrades exist in the world that require deliberate searching to find. It's a high utility item and allows for multiple swappable attachments so you can create the perfect setup to cross 
crush the game. It's the soul of the build in Sekiro. Huge missed opportunity, not giving the player a command grab, Izuna drop prosthetic, though. The problem is, mostly, that on original release, the thing burned through its fuel very quickly, making players less likely to use it at all, except in dire situations. And even that's a stretch, because wasting fuel in a boss battle you know you'll die in makes abusing the prosthetic a waste. And even though consumption was altered in a later patch, the cost to upgrade is still prohibitively high until late game, especially for a first-time player losing all their money dying repeatedly without realizing that light banking exists. It's a cool feature that's strained by the conditions it exists under. Like most of the game, if the fuel were readily available and cheaper than dirt, it might get more regular use, but for now, it's a power player's tool, not a regular difficulty supplement. The other aspect of the build is the skill system, a series of trees you can push points into to unlock new abilities, mostly combat pricks. It's frustratingly easy to dip into bad trees or bad skills without really understanding them, and a few unlockable trees exist, making the system, once again, fairly incompatible with newer players. I actually fully restarted the game about two hours in just to have access to a skill I later learned would help me beat the game because I was so off track. It's not an awful system, and a lot of the abilities are cool and highly damaging. Several change the pace of combat and meaningfully lessen the difficulty. Just good luck figuring things out yourself. Even Neo offers the player a chance to see what the skill does. I get that watching an MP4 in-game isn't as immersive as an inky approximation, and presentation matters, but interfacing with permanent skill choices can and should be better. And yeah, okay, I'm getting a bit nitpicky, I know. Shut up, go back to having fun. Admittedly, most basic skills have end-game uses, so it's not impossible to just stick with a borked investment portfolio. So this is all really illustrative of why Sekiro is annoying to talk about and read opinions about. The fact is, no matter how rewarding, the game's really, really rough on its players and doesn't really attempt to onboard them either. And that's hardly a new criticism in the hardcore action game scene, to be clear. But once you've got the skills, the game is so fun and epic and neat, you guys. Uh, he clipped. <laughs> and I'm not even kidding. I love how the sword clashes sound and feel. I love how powerful yet fragile Sekiro is. How you really become a shinobi through harsh training. It pays off in spades. It just takes 40 hours of gameplay. Do you have 40 hours? Do you have $20 for a new controller? Ugh. I'm not that cynical. It's just a rough experience sometimes, but the levels are something to behold. Even better than Elden Ring's ambient rating and epic scenery. Every level, minus the one or two ugly, smelly ones, is stunning, gorgeous, bathed in sunlight. They paint a mythological picture of historical Japan, and they're fun to sneak through. You're allowed to play the game as aggressively as you want, but most of the levels allow for some stealth at minimum. It's cool to be a ninja, especially in a game shooting far beyond what Ninja Gaiden and Tenchi you ever did to actually encapsulate the ninja experience. And that's coming from a Ninja Gaiden stand. From Deep Lake to Tree Branch, every inch of the game feels ripe for exploration and curated for ninja gameplay. And you have so much raw power, not because of your combat abilities, but your pure mobility. You can zip out of combat in a flash if you really want to, but progression doesn't often compromise or fold to mobility. You still need to engage with the systems and mechanics to pass through the levels and take down the enemy. That's part of the beauty of the skill system, actually. You won't get any experience if you don't kill. So Sekiro has a leg up on other games in the lineage. That's right, in the sole spin-off with the greatest player capacity to avoid enemy placement and level design, you're still looped in. At least if you want to upgrade your avatar. Now, you're not forced into anything, Sekiro doesn't care if you handle things honorably or not, and frankly, honor wasn't a thing in Japan in this time period the way it's been mythologized. So, say, if you wanted to lower a mini-boss down a trail and trap her AI behind a rock so that the internal logic breaks and she can't block her escape, well, this is actually good because I am a ninja. And if you want to get butthurt in the comments about this, um, I use my instant kill shuriken ninjutsu and kill you instantly and then you die and your comment is gone. Many levels and bosses have some kind of associated cheese and learning it goes further in Sekiro than other games just on the merits of overall difficulty. But to be honest, most quote cheese boss strategies and tricks are so specific and difficult to execute. It's almost better to just accept you're going to be stuck for a few hours and 
and hitting the grinder. It's an unforgiving and uncompromising time. The good news for non-griefer types is that Sekiro is totally offline, unlike other Souls games, presumably because they wanted to craft a meaningful experience that would stick with players, one unfettered from constant interruptions and annoying comedy messages about applying one's anus to the nearest signpost. I think it paid off. The experience is respectable. Yes, the monkeys will fart and slingshot at you, but you know what? That's just contextually appropriate comedy, and it wasn't cobbled together in a tiny box by some guy farming upvotes. I think I just described my channel. Sekiro also taps into something I love about video games, and series like Soul Calibur and Sam Show specifically, it represents the platonic ideal of the duel. Two warriors, swords drawn, fighting to the death. It's one of my favorite things in gaming, cause like, I ain't pulling that shit IRL, I need my limbs. And one thing Souls struggles with is making good use of humanoid enemies. A lot of the Souls bosses are monsters, giants, and even the fights intended to evoke the dual concept feel unfair fundamentally, like you're not really on equal footing, not making use of the same tools. Bloodborne closes the gap with enemy hunters, slightly, but Sekiro pushes it to the extreme, featuring all kinds of powerful warriors to cross swords with, people to triumph over, it doesn't matter if they're huge or differently armed, your parry nullifies the differences between you and whoever you're fighting. They feel genuine even when you're technically overpowered by comparison, and the animations go so far to sell the concept. And we'll get into bosses, but it's worth bringing up that even before Elden Ring, the great open world Souls extravaganza, Sekiro allowed the player multiple diverging paths after the early game, meaning that if you hit a boss that's too hard, you can go somewhere else and occupy yourself. At least it accounts for its own filter points. I have to respect that. So filter points, or some say bosses. Sekiro is masterful at kicking players out. Anyone who calls this game easy or sneers at general criticism regarding the gameplay is probably getting a little too defensive of something that's empirically infuriating. Across PS4 and Steam achievements, the total percentage of players who bother to finish the game and kill the Sword Saint boss is about 30%, not accounting for secret or optional bosses. That's about the same percentage of players who beat the Nameless King, a secret boss in Dark Souls 3 that was often thought of as the hardest fight in Souls for a time. The number of players who complete the first major boss, Gyobu, is about 60%. 40% leave before finishing, like, the Taurus Demon, basically, or Yudex Gundir. Okay, that's not a totally fair comparison. Admittedly, the intro through to the first boss is pretty protracted. Your mates have physically traversed much more space than those other examples, complete a really boring tutorial. The player will likely be distracted with entering the past at some point, or have to deal with Dragon Rod, and between learning the game and figuring out where to go, it's understandable that several players decide that the game's not for them. Fair enough. What follows, though, traveling into Sekiro's past for an exciting night raid on the Harada estate, is Juzo the Drunkard, followed by Lady Butterfly. This level is frustrating on its own. It's absolutely stuffed with enemies, and players will need to be pretty aggressive and mobile, able to find and use the X prosthetic to deal with shields for the first time, possibly get demoralized like I did when they reached Juzo, and have an NPC rush in, only to find that he's difficult to save, and even if you do, there's no reward for doing so. And then then walking into Lady Butterfly, a lightning-quick, camera-jarring shinobi who summons ghosts and can one-shot you with magic. It's annoying at best. That entire segment cost the game about 10% of its players, and it's not really hard to see why. But filtering can be good. It's a way to kick people out early. I usually scream at the start of my videos because I don't want some dry spiceless f to get needlessly bothered because I'm not reading a Wikipedia article. Filter first, and the remainder will be more tolerant. That's just good curation. And true enough, Sekiro only bleeds around 20% of its players afterwards all the way through to the final boss. Now, about half of that final remainder even see the bad ending, but I did, so I guess I'm just built different. What I like about the bosses most is the upgrade system. Instead of shoving whatever rocks and materials into your weapons to buff them as much as possible, you're only really allowed to upgrade your strength with the memory of a dead boss, a consumable dropped on completion. That means you're always where you're supposed to be. You can't blame the weapon you have. The experience and the difficulty are intentional. Sekiro makes great strides to filter its players and temper the remainder. It doesn't distract with multiplayer, and it rewards the faithful with a lush world and a 
gripping drama, alongside the sharpest gameplay in the series. I didn't like the developer comments about accessibility in 2 because, purely based on what I played, not much was meaningfully made accessible. I can respect that Sekiro is selective about its players, even if it's really, really annoying. Actively limiting your base just seems like bad business, but at least it's honest. It's akin to the developer saying, yeah, this isn't for everyone, so catch a long play if you don't think you can handle it. That said, you actually have to buy and play the thing to get kicked out. That's why this shit is discourse. I've said before that the levels of Souls games are often more difficult than the bosses, at least if you're actually engaging with them and not, you know, running on through. Sekiro's bosses are the only real standout, so hard that fighting through the level feels mandatory to a point. If I can't beat the level, can I really deal with the boss? Each of them has some kind of gimmick or consideration. They're all flavored. None are generic, and that's important in a Souls game. Usually one or two throwaways exist, light speed bumps you flatten on your way to the plot. Here you'll fight the occasional sub-boss, but you know when the real fights are happening. The early bosses focused on the grappling hook and making use of the sword and prosthetic in tandem, for the most part, but Genichiro is ridiculously punishing with attacks and asks the player to add the jump aspect of Bop It into their play alongside the Mikiri counter. It's one of the hardest early fights for demanding the full range of the player's abilities and threatening at range with the bow. Even worse, he's got three lives between two phases, meaning you need to land a total of three death blows to finish the fight. In his transformed state, he'll throw lightning which can be reflected, but is isn't really understandable without trying a few times, and definitely isn't tutorialized until the moment it's flying at you. Which means struggling through the hardest boss up until this point in the game multiple times to get enough experience to smack him down with lightning. It's not a fun time, exactly. Really flashy though, the folding screen monkeys are probably the easiest fight in the game, acting is more of a puzzle than a battle. I'm glad they threw a free one in for the player at some point, one that focuses more on mobility and forethought than anything, and definitely the best example of a puzzle boss in the lineage. The Guardian Ape is a fight I never learned properly. Because of how frustrating every boss is and how limited my schedule was, I went online and learned that you can run around the arena to bait the feces fling, and so I did. Wait for the ape to drop a fat thump run under, and punish. A friend asked me if I was surprised when he got back up, but unfortunately the entire internet spoiled the moment seconds after release, so no. Cool sh** attack though. The Headless Ape is a fight I did learn, however, and of course I did. It's got really clear and reactable parry windows that make the battle really epic and enjoyable all around. That clang is easily in the top 10 most satisfying game sounds. The Corrupted Monk walled me out initially. It's a complex fight, enough that the game uses it twice, so the learning curve was sure to be steep. Unfortunately, I learned here that you can buff your sword via the life-severing blade just outside the boss room and practically bully him into submission. That was the first time I got the fight to work in my favor, and it made me realize that the game really doesn't care how you beat it, and you shouldn't either. If droves of players are leaving before reaching the final boss, if you're a ninja instead of, say, a samurai, why wouldn't you make use of every dirty trick to finish the fight. There is a diverging point in the story here, so let me talk about some specific fights before the relevant plot content. The Divine Dragon is nestled in a really difficult level, but hardly qualifies as difficult himself, mostly requiring some casual L1 management and basic aiming to zap him with lightning. It's a visually stunning fight regardless, something Sekiro does amazing work with. So many sights and scenes are just top of the pile, even for this series. The Demon of Hatred is basically a Bloodborne boss in the wrong game. See, in Bloodborne, fighting a giant monster wouldn't be an issue, with the extremely generous dodge iframes and ridiculous damage potential of most weapons. Unfortunately, it doesn't really belong in Sekiro, and I was forced, late at night and tired of my first playthrough, to cheese the fight and trick him off a cliff. Cringy? Yes, but so is this fight, so sue me. Three death blows and a huge health bar on these damage values? <laughs> So the diverging point. This ties directly into the story, so spoilers, I guess. You can engage with the story as minimally as possible and still be faced with a choice at the top of Ashina Castle on your return. The game cuts off fast travel, so you know you're meant to work your way through the stage again, this time with a mountain of experience backing your blade. There you meet the owl, your father, effectively. The great shinobi of the land who taught you the iron code from a young age. Your father comes first, your master a close second. Of course, if the player is paying attention, it should be obvious that what the owl wants wants from Kuro is eternal life, nothing noble or helpful for the world at all. If obeying your father unquestioningly leads Sekiro to murder longtime ally Emma, so 
That's probably a yikes. And ultimately the ancient Ishin Ashina, a figure from the same old era as Owl and Lady Butterfly. There's a lot of history and even mysticism that informs the scene, but suffice it to say that slaying everyone will taint Sekiro so fundamentally that he becomes a Shora, someone who kills for the sake of killing. So thoroughly evil and without principle that he physically drips with demonic energy. Most players don't bother with this route because it's so obvious that Owl is manipulating the player, and the outcome is pretty crummy overall, but it's one potential ending. The path to the good ending starts long before Owl, but ignoring the typical Soulsborne esotericism, you'll eventually choose to disobey your corrupt father. The fight is hard, if only because he can almost fully kill you if you land to parry, so that's fine. But he's nothing compared to the final boss. Genichiro and Ishin the Sword Saint are the actual endgame bosses. The fight is three full stages, and if it hasn't been made obvious by the combat's complexity, the high lethality, and the frequent multi-phase fights, Sekiro is more a game of player endurance than anything. It preys on players by putting them under extreme pressure and either shunting them entirely or forcing a player into being a fan. It's frustrating design, but undoubtedly effective, especially for a side game. They got to experiment, design a truly evil experience and say it's for enthusiasts, and the enthusiasts get what they paid for. Sword Saint Ishin is where I cracked, personally. I don't remember how much the controller was, but I'll be writing it off this tax season. I ended up going online and finding out you can run around the arena carefully, bait out a specific move, and punish with a single light attack. 15 minutes of this, at 3am on a Sunday, while texting my friend who was sleeping and probably trying to rest for work the next day. Sekiro is maybe the hardest thing I've played for the show, and easily the hardest thing I've played this year. Like I've said for other videos, you absolutely shouldn't have to play games on a schedule. So really, I made my bed and now I'm sleeping in it, but I really think this game needs a warning or something. Like, only for people with nothing going on, or for people who live with their parents and whose parents make them dinner for free, or for people who think learning languages is stupid, or for people who want to talk about how good they are at a game but who can't change an oven's bake element, for example. So Sekiro was fun. I mean the rerun was fun. I blew through the game in two days, and that feels pretty good. And for experts and multi-runners, there's extra boss rush stuff, bonus costumes, so much to upgrade, and four total endings. It's the kind of game you can sit down and work with. An elevated version of the industry diverging design that Dark Souls was. You too could be the next Sekiro Master. A real-life virtual shinobi. Are you finished running from your fate? It's true, what you say. I'm not the best game reviewer, and nowhere close to the funniest or most charismatic. I barely have my life together. But I'm here, regardless. Yes, through your own efforts, your own strength, embrace your power. You're wrong. I didn't get myself here, even though I want to pretend I'm an island. It was them, all those people, who put me where I am today. And if I can't remember that much, this whole thing was worthless. You can't kill me. You'll destroy your cringe. Your greatest strength. Destroy cringe. I'm right here. And I'm done running. I told you, Xbox. I'm still here. Some will criticize me for being a poor kid and playing this at 24 FPS-ish on PS4, but you know what? That's cinematic. Okay, it's not low grade, it's cinematic. SHIT! Elden Ring released earlier this year, solidifying a single question in the Dark Souls discourse. Can FromSoft miss? Just miss FromSoft once. Please! Elden Ring got a lot of press. It's a smothering force in gaming. You've heard about it, and either played it, or wish everyone would shut the Whoa! f*** up already. As someone who buys so few new games, it's my favorite thing from this year. It's effectively replaced Dark Souls 3 as the definitive Souls build game, if I get the itch. Elden Ring's roots run deep. It's an absolute feast for Souls fans, informed by every part of the lineage, and further to that, Elden Ring is the first World of Warcraft I've played since World of Warcraft. It's the first true journey I've had in years. Obviously the two aren't alike at all, an MMO versus an action RPG, but nothing else has really instilled that same sense of wonder, the hunger to explore, the ability to look out over a land you've mastered. 
I'm having a hard time putting words down just because of its scope. Elden Ring is enormous. It's so big that I casually managed to miss even seeing a commonly encountered NPC my friends were talking about, and I dug around the corners of the map for a long time, even in the late game, so I've definitely missed enough. But I also took the time to beat most major optional bosses. I've seen takes about Elden Ring being unreplayable, simply too large, and after completion, too predictable and tiring to bother with again. I don't think I've wanted another run of something so badly in my life, and the only thing stopping me is the mountain of other games to play on top of Xenoblade Chronicles. Elden Ring is worth the money and worth the time, if you appreciate the usual Soulsborne contest of player groin bongo. So what's on offer? It's the very first open world Souls game, mechanically approximate to Dark Souls 3 with jumping and horseback riding. Open worlds have a bit of a tarnished reputation nowadays, at least with think brains and people like me who enjoy concise crafted experiences more than repetitious floundering in enormous content cesspits. Not that all open worlds are that, I'm just a little burnt off one too many. It's telling me to go down? Oh, come on, man, I trusted you! But Elden Ring resists that kind of complaint at a baseline. Most popular open world games are very easy or can be adjusted down, which is good for broader audiences, but I tend to play tough games now. I like being made to pay attention, and Souls games do well there. So now, exploration has stakes. I'm tuned into the world in a way I normally wouldn't be. Even if the childlike fascination with game environments, the what's in that cave, it could be anything, even if that's faded with time almost completely. Elden Ring tunes older players into that experience by demanding engagement. Now it's genuinely, what's in that cave? Can I even get the treasure inside? Let's find out! So the functional reality of Souls gameplay, the difficulty, passively solves an issue with open world games. I think the other major issue with this genre is bloat. Piles of extraneous content and systems that muddy any kind of core experience. You're not doing anything really meaningful or interesting, but a lot of disjointed stuff. And that can be fun for some players too. Occupation is one of the key pillars of happiness making in humans, according to positive psychology. But for connoisseurs and all those who've been there, done that, it's great to see the crafting system shoved into menus, totally optional and barely affecting the experience for most builds. I guess Souls side quests aren't served well, necessarily. They were always easily missable, but now that the world map has completely ballooned, it can be frustrating trying to figure out where this or that character ran off to. Hotman strike. Oh my god! Oh! Thankfully, side quests don't often have incredible rewards, certainly nothing necessary for completion anyway. It feels like the system is finally being honest with itself, like, you know what, player? Don't feel bad looking stuff up. Go ahead, you're free. That's a small but important point. Laissez-faire Souls players willing to consult a guide are usually derided by the hardcore redditeur who figured it all out themselves. You know, having minimal real-world obligations and not accounting for personal situations and preferences. Some people like to police the gaming of others. Couldn't tell you why. But Elden Ring will force it one way or another, either because of the intensely difficult boss fights, or the side quest you can't find, or the ending you want, or the weapon you need to finish your build. Getting help online was always a developer consideration, I think. It's a series that utilized multiplayer and came out in the internet age. It's a series that sparked conversation out of game. And the broadening of scope lends credence to the idea that Souls games should be handled at the individual player's discretion. Honorable or cutthroat, the only person who really cares about your story is you. According to Dungeon Master and games industry vet Matt Colville, players of games his company worked on would endlessly barrage him at conventions with stories of their character, like anyone could possibly care for longer than two minutes about your incredible fictional exploit. And I think if you have any level of social expertise, that should be understood as annoying. What you've done in a game is your own, purely your own. Why would it be any different in Souls? So the FromSoft formula applies pretty well to an open world framework. Neat. What gets lost in translation? Well, something the main games were hit or miss about and what Bloodborne and Sekiro mastered, on repeat playthroughs that is, was the arcadey boss rush vibe. Elden Ring may be a Souls spin-off, but it's distinct from the other two titles covered in this video. In what other game could I live out the fantasy 
of bathing in the lava of hell. It'll feel much more familiar to Dark Souls fans than Bloodborne or Sekiro with their quick and pace and focus design, or even something like Demon Souls with its directed level selection. It really might as well be called Dark Souls 4. The major difference is fundamentally about world size and construction. Otherwise, the major selling points are intact. The build, the battles, the lore, the story structure, and, for fans, it's just a whole lot more game. The intro to Elden Ring details info about the worlds. You wake up as one of the tarnished, people who lost the grace of the Erd Tree and were exiled by a certain monarch. Once the Elden Ring was broken, the tarnished were lured by lost grace. And yes, we're swimming in nouns right now. And yes, this is functionally identical to Dark Souls 3. You're a person that sucks. A powerful force you're inherently linked to needs mending. You're compelled to do the thing. And entering that world for the first time, my god. Of all the things I love about Elden Ring, visual design is at the top of the pile. Demons through DS3, the world was beautiful in frames, but mostly drab or faded, and that's fitting considering the settings, the vibes of individual games, but Elden Ring pushes the visuals in such an incredible way. I'll explain myself. Okay, fantasy. Elden Ring is a fantasy game like many, many others, from Dragon's Dogma to Skyrim to Baldur's Gate, sure, but most games settle for the basic tropes of traditional fantasy presentation and stick to a specific vision. So you either get low-key, medieval, bland countryside, like Dragon's Dogma, Dragon Age, etc., or the game is constructed more cartoony, like mana, leading to color-drenched environments, distilled whimsy. Elden Ring merges those opposing ethoses with a painted world, a canvas whose colors and shapes are constantly shifting, making use of truly fantastical palettes, the purple sky set amid golden leaves, the heart Harsh red paired with blight and decay, all of it set under the golden gaze of the Erd trees, these radiant monoliths. I want as much of this as I can get in games, genuinely. I'm leaving this on the screen for a second. Okay, appreciation time is concluded. The world is lush and multi-layered. You're free to roam the land in search of bandit camps, to route caravans to raid. There's something on literally every part of the map. It's a unique experience in the Souls series. There just aren't chunks of significant micro-content sprinkled in the other entries. Look, there's a fortress. I can run in and kill everyone on site for treasure, or not. And as for being layered, the world is riddled with cave systems and mines to explore. That's expected, but you can also go deep, deep into the earth to uncover a series of underground ecosystems. It's wild. Yeah, quick draw is a cool skill. Yeah, how long does this thing go? Holy shit, dude. Verticality was always a part of Souls, both in basic level design and world design, but Elden Ring takes it far beyond the premise. It really feels like Miyazaki is getting everything he wants. He's got a fixation for paintings, so what if the whole world was a painting? And you could find paintings in places too. Yo, I heard you like paintings, so I put a painting in your painting so you can appreciate paint. Miyazaki loves putting insanely steep drops in winding catacombs, so why not make an entire below ground mini world? That's what I get from Elden Elden Ring, Souls Plus, Souls Extra Large, excuse me, would you like to upsize your souls? And like I mentioned, you can engage with the world in multiple ways, hanging out with NPCs at the Round Table Hold Hub, collecting items and hunting for treasure, it's your quest, and almost everything is optional. Why are there fingers? Why are there fingers? Why are there dead fingers and multiplayer item fingers? Oh hey, here's a lore dump about fingers, wasn't that finger- I I mean, fascinating. There's something to say for something with so much to do, all of it optional, but a series of highly challenging checkpoints blocking progression. While you're never made to branch out into the wilderness cut from the beaten path, you're usually rewarded for doing so. It's a quality way to save on mental strain. See, Souls has been kicking players out forever, mercilessly. But Elden Ring offers one of the greatest accessibility options yet, not forcing the player to keep banging their head against a wall, cause while that works for some people, others really don't don't like banging their head on a wall. So explore, power up, find something, anything, and by the time you're done, you'll be refreshed for another round with the boss you couldn't handle. Diverging paths have always been a part of Souls games, but Elden Ring gives you a whole ass national park. Oh my god, I found him! The loathsome shit eater! 
Duh! Let's talk about the horse, though. Overland travel wouldn't be possible in a game this size without a mount. You can freely summon and dismiss the thing unless it gets knocked down in combat, at which point you'll have to sacrifice a charge of your Estus Flask equivalent to call it back. Mounted combat is the major tack-on addition to the General Souls gameplay on offer, and it had a chance to suck. Mounted combat usually does, if only because it's an underutilized subsystem in many games. Thankfully, it's actually really good. You can easily land light or heavy strikes on opponents with a little practice. It's quick and responsive, appropriately weighty, and depending on your build, potentially optimal for keeping mobility up in certain encounters. Sometimes AAA games don't feel like every aspect is AAA, but Souls does well with mechanics. I mean, okay, no horse ball shrinkage, but good enough, right? <laughs> Another minor addition, though only to the Dark Souls design lineage, exists as well, the stealth system. I say system, but it's like a button, and enemies will or won't see you depending on exactly zero vision cones or indicators, you're seen or not. In one way that's kind of accurate to something like Dungeons and Dragons, the role you make, or in Elden Ring the moves you make, might be good or not, but you don't have perfect information of your enemy's perception. So you're ultimately freewheeling it, going by gut regardless of the roles. Sneaking is cool, I think every game with rogue gameplay stapled on is trying something neat. Stabbing dudes is fun, it's especially cool to creep through a camp of enemies and pick them off. Some Something you always should have been able to do in Dark Souls, especially with the way those games attempted to sell Rogue as a class type. But with Sekiro laying the base, Elden Ring finally got a system to work. It's not incredible, but it functions, a utility option instead of a complete playstyle. I guess I have to mention jumping. It took this many games, and again Sekiro laying the base, to get a jump button in a Dark Souls game. I didn't find myself spamming jump in combat too often, it kind of depends on your build and weapon, but but it can be used strategically to send a mobile hitbox at a hapless enemy, so it's a little sneakier than it looks. In that sense, it replaces the old school jump attack of Bloodborne and others well, which was slightly overcommittal and hard to make use of. The jump's been patched a couple of times too, having granted players immense invincibility frames when initially introduced, but otherwise the jump mostly gets used to bamboozle idiot enemies when you're trying to escape, or specifically for flying enemies. Good addition overall. Other than those things, gameplay, so combat, Dark Souls is about combat, is basically the same. Okay. Oh, you idiot! You idiot! Two buttons for each hand, stance swapping, etc. It feels more or less identical to Dark Souls 3 from basic L1 spam to weapon art, so it's hard to make new and interesting points about. The one thing that's changed is enemy diversity and boss size. Not a ton, but hear me out. The game is so big that many more enemies than usual were designed to populate the environments. While a given area might have a basic tent post enemy type, like the horrible disgusting centipede men in Kaelid, several are transliterated across multiple zones. There's casters, warriors, zombies, hands. Oh, no, you get away! You know, like Indiana Jones. Hands! Why did it have to be hands? I haven't really bothered to break down enemies across the games because for the most part, they don't matter. Like yes, they present different challenges to the player, but they're slightly different flavors of challenge. Skittles in the bag. Orange ones let you L1 spam, but purple ones make you wait. You get the picture. That's where my focus on builds and build diversity come from. Those are the elements that actually change how combat plays out. Excepting bosses, of course, but bosses often feel like the only canon challenges in souls anyhow. I've been neglecting dexterity throughout the games, focusing mostly on strength and faith, quality, intelligence and faith, and eventually a mostly dex build but shut up, and finally strength focused quality. I haven't been playing rogues because a lot of souls isn't designed for them, and shields are so massively beneficial in so many games. I didn't want to let go of mine, so I didn't. I played dexterity and intelligence, specifically wielding a cold infused uchi katana, and later picked up a moon veil as well. So when Marika asked me, will you take my quest and become the Elden Lord? I said, Elden Lord? <laughs> something like that. And as tempting as that beautiful crimson rivers of blood katana was, I gotta say, building double damage procs via frost and bleed damage is some kind of way to play souls. It was rewarding in a low key way, the idea that landing consistent hits can lead to an immense payoff, being persistent and determined is strength. Elden Ring would have been the best opportunity to go hard caster, and many have, but they're so 
So much to do in this game with your character, even between like builds with different weapons, different weapon arts, and there's an amount of customization beyond your typical Souls game. In 3, weapons had set arts that were immutable, and while that lends value to the specific weapon you've got, in Elden Ring you can swap out your weapon arts and damage types, so instead of wielding a sharp Uchi Katana with the quick draw ability, a respectful and flavorful choice, I've got an ice laced blade and a gigantic frost stomp ability. And this is all really basic stuff. Stuff, whatever you want for your character is probably in the game. I can't get enough of it. The sheer volume of ways to test your build and your skills between a hundred mini bosses, the main game, and every major area. It feels genuinely impossible to run out of options. For character builders, Elden Ring is paradise. Every player has a point where criticism doesn't matter. Like, if enough of this bar fills up, I'm happy, regardless of the rest. For Elden Ring, in conjunction with aesthetics, gameplay, and content, the build options make it irrefutable worth your time. That said, builds require time. I've effectively glossed 60 hours of game in a few minutes, but that's part of what makes Elden Ring special. You start as this lowly, pathetic individual, no different than other Souls games, but the lengths you have to go, the depths you have to plumb, and the pressure you're put under tell a story over time, from the weapons you wield to the armor you wear. Your character ingratiates themselves with other characters, accomplishes great things. There's always a sense that you're building to something. Characters will frequently remark that a mere tarnished could never become the Elden Lord, but it's a highly rewarding experience overall, one that tells a story with gameplay. At one point, you're offered the chance to totally reshape your appearance and even sex at will. That's a fantastical reward for the kind of fantasy Elden Ring is selling, the story of a hero on an epic journey. But let's be thorough and have a go at critiquing what's obvious. Depending on which version of the game we're talking about, completion rate is around 25% roughly. That's actually not terrible, making Elden Ring either more alluring or easier than Sekiro in total. I think there's an argument for either. Elden Ring gives the player more freedom to explore and more options for dealing with problems. Further to that, Elden Ring is a lot easier a lot of the time. The bosses just aren't designed to make your life miserable until the very late game. Some are frustrating like Souls bosses are, but don't have multiple health bars, nor demand the same obscene level of precision. I thought Melania was the most ridiculous fight in the game by a mile, but she's numerically twice as beatable as Sekiro's final boss. Now, a lot of factors affect this data, and my analysis is embarrassingly surface level at best. Not able to account for platform discrepancy, longevity of release, etc., but it's mostly accurate to my own experience as well. Elden Ring doesn't have a lot of eject the player moments. It's smooth enough, open enough to account for a variety of players and experience levels. Some early frustrations exist, Margit the Fellowman being the usual, but if online play exists, if you can summon allies for most bosses, if you can create a summonable ally with an entirely new subsystem. If you can just leave, Elden Ring is more accessible than any other Souls game. Players are free to drop the pretense that these titles are intended to be handled very specifically, very honorably. The runaway smash hit with all the reviews and the sales and developer support is right here, openly conveying this stuff. There is one argument that I think has some weight that kind of knocks Elden Ring down half a peg. No matter how you slice it, the game simply isn't capable of delivering tightly cropped encounters counters in a sequence. It's genuinely incapable of providing a steady stream of ramping challenges because it's an open world with very few limits. You can end up in an extremely dangerous zone just minutes away from the starting area. To be clear, I don't think the criticism actually matters to most people. The other Souls games were pretty tightly designed, and some actually fail to provide a reasonable or clean stream of difficulty. Spikes happen all the time, just like Elden Ring, but that technical imperfection is accounted for in the intro. Once you step out of the tutorial zone, you'll meet this hulking golden horseman, and that enemy won't have any trouble wiping out a fresh tarnished, so you either brute force it, prepping you for future problems, or take a look at the world map. You're free to go left to the coast to find a dungeon, free to go right to find all kinds of small encounters, or free to go south for an entire region that's level appropriate. You're taught that difficulty spikes will happen, and looking around to help yourself is good. I think it's kind of a Chad play to whip out that early boss fight right out the gate. That's hilarious, and effective, the kind of thing safer, more pillowy open world games would never risk. It's easy, I think, to hand wave criticism about the major bosses for those reasons. The player can effectively lessen the challenge and, in more than one way, direct level ups, NPC summons, online, etc. But to be clear, most of the major Elden Ring bosses are 
crazy, easily harder than whatever was going on in Demons Through 3. That's something I hinted at earlier. I believe that Artorius was the first iteration of truly tight boss battles in this series, in a game that he actively subverted the design of. Not every fight was intended to be an Artorius. By 3, we see a massive proliferation in speedy and highly damaging bosses, and that's mostly subverted by the increased reliance on the dodge roll, but several fights strained credulity regardless. They were tight, demanded mastery over a certain percentage of the boss's patterns. That gets taken over the top in Sekiro, where bosses, at least on first pass, are absolute grinders. True battles of timing, endurance, and reactions. Yes, it's complex bop it, but critically it's played out under intensely stressful conditions. Elden Ring leans back from Sekiro and turns several fights into miniature or even full-blown Slave Knight Gales. So many of the required battles are multi-phase, highly mobile, devastating humanoids with deep move pools. The level of challenge ramps up gradually and gets fairly f Whoa! insane. I already called out Melania because that fight is garbage. It's not even ambiguous. Her dodge windows are too tight. Her damage is too high. Her moves are obscene. Oh, cool. Great. And the only thing really saving the experience is summonable monsters. In fact, Melenia alone got me to go out and find the Mimic Veil at all. And when that failed, got me to go out and find the Black Knife Tish summon. And that doesn't feel good, having to give up on something because, mostly, I was spending too much time on a single optional boss for nothing but pride. So I went out and removed the problem. Some other fights come close, but none really match this one in particular. But the complexity creep of Souls boss is endemic to the series now. The studio needs to drum up new challenges for longtime fans, so Elden Ring scales up even some of the early fights, while blowing later ones far, far out of proportion for the series' scope. Think of fights like Radagon, who Wait, what happened? Think of fights like Loretta, a fairly innocuous mounted enemy, I until you get a look at her damage, her mix of deadly projectiles and crushing melee attacks, her overall speed and mobility, the frequency with which she attacks, the fact that she powers up partway through the fight, making it that much harder. This is a mid-game boss. It's insane how deeply layered this fight is. They even bring her back in the late game. Well, maybe it was designed for the end and ported into a mid-range castle later. Who knows? How about this wolf man with a sword? He's found at the bottom of a castle and ends up being a regular enemy late in the game. But at the early stages is so overwhelming. Can pound your avatar so hard. It's just... Like early in Dark Souls, we fought the Taurus Demon and like Champion Gundir and all those fights can be hard, but they weren't super mobile. I feel like you can't be safe dodging once through an attack anymore. Like you gotta have a second queued up half the time. The trick is neither this boss nor Loretta are mandatory. Only 13 Elden Ring bosses are actually required to complete the game, and I'm not even confident in that number. And yet the abject insanity of bosses goes back to the early stages. Mark at the Fell Omen is the first mandatory boss, one that frequently shunts players off the main path with his specific brand of nonsense. It doesn't feel worthwhile to even break the battles down, so few are actually necessary, and so many alternate paths around certain challenges exist, and your build factors in so heavily that Elden Ring is purely an individual experience, unless you're playing a co-op. But regardless, it's a game that you will uniquely experience and resist compartmentalization by design. There are too many builds and too many options to even begin to contend with. It's so new and so frequently patched as well that most of what I say could change in a year's time. All that's really left is a scrap book of a journey. Now, I don't want to sloppily apply literary theory to a video game. It's doable if we're reading the game as a text, of course, but enough factors unique to games resist raw literary analysis. It's hard to weigh the worth of an author, specifically when there's programmers, directors, and publishers to worry about, when writing isn't the first concern. And that's before getting into team dynamics and other problems, you know, how the writing team interacts with the others. But I've been reading an essay by Stephen R. Donaldson on the difference between fiction and fantasy, wherein the author posits that fantasy, as distinct from mainstream fiction, features a world that is reflective of the protagonist's struggles. So a villain might reflect a part of the protagonist or shape the story purely because of the protagonist. In short, the protagonist's internal struggles are externalized. The opposite, simply fiction, would instead present a world that exists regardless of the protagonist. I often extol the virtues of a world that exists regardless of the players across both Dungeons & Dragons and video games because it creates believability. 
ability if the intention is to allow a player to become entranced by the world, allow them to immerse genuinely. It's not that one of these modes is better, but that they value different things. Fantasy is often about hope, going out and finding the answers, setting things right with the world, which is a reflection of the self and therefore solving the self. Fiction often dramatizes the failings of mankind. The species is brittle, passionate fading flames and a cosmic framework left largely unchanged by the time the conclusion arrives. So how does Elden Ring fit into that discussion? The protagonist is a fluid individual with a role. So not someone with a highly specific backstory, but instead someone belonging to a class of persons, the Tarnished. Unfortunately, there isn't a lot to go on regarding the Tarnished as a group. They appear to be risen undead, some locked into endless life for a spoiler reason, but enough confusing and seemingly contradictory evidence makes discerning the true origins of the character a wash. So the world can't be reflective of the protagonist because they're ultimately an amorphous nobody. You go out and meet characters that have lived in the world for years, and none of them really know or care about who you are. Except that this is a video game. So the world is actually designed for the player, constructed for a player character. I know. Cute trick, K-Bash, nice idiot flourish, but seriously, how do you square that? Where does that leave Elden Ring? It's a video game, a multidisciplinary project by design. Literary criticism is a single vector of analysis, and so I think it's fun to open it up past what's obvious. I think Elden Ring is fiction that breeds fantasy. I've seen a lot of hand-wringing about the quality and clarity of the story, and really, I don't think it matters. It's not a super interesting discussion to me, and mostly because Elden Ring is aping Dark Souls tropes en masse to cobble the sloppiest of secondary universes, even if the branding's really good. And Elden Ring isn't meant to be understood as a clear, linear narrative. It has wildly diverging ending options and optional side quests that affect the final outcome. You don't even need to take the same steps to reach the conclusion. What you need to know is that the world exists regardless of your avatar. You're fully expected to fail. There are potentially hundreds, if not thousands of tarnished in the world, and you have no bearing on the Academy, on the Golden City, on the Blighted Lands, or the Halic Tree, except for your physically walking through them. You're another guy in a fictional world. You don't meet challenges that reflect your character because your character is not a complete person. Elden Ring can't be used to explore your dark side. What dark side is there? Now, it could act as a fantasy and reflect the Tarnished as a concept regardless. In Dark Souls tradition, many characters are figureheads of a dying age that you're made to slaughter, but I don't think that's really an externalization of the internal reality of being Tarnished. We know almost nothing Thing about Tarnished in general, just that they're similar to the Unkindled from 3. So yes, you could, in this ridiculous theoretical framework, say, well, I think Godric is an externalization of the internal realities of being Tarnished, Godric being the weakest demigod with the most diluted blood from the lineage, a pitiful almost outsider to his own caste, something the Tarnished likely sees in themselves. But not every major boss is like this, so you really are just another Tarnished, another player in a multiplayer game. I mean, maintain that it's fiction in the sense that the world goes on without the player, that the player's individuality isn't meaningfully explored or detailed enough. But a fantasy specific to the medium of video games does arise out of the experience. Every challenge, every boss defeated is a reflection of player growth in a game set to halt your progress. Like every Souls game, Elden Ring is designed as a challenge and Miyazaki just wants players to learn to enjoy the feeling of overcoming challenge. You literally go out into the world when you're stuck find answers, and self-actualize, become, destroy the weak part of yourself by striking down a crushing enemy. Different bosses test different things, like any Souls game, they demand the player act accordingly to the situation and demonstrate ability, overcome adversity. Oh no. Oh! Oh, shit! That's the functional soul of fantasy conflict. And because it's player specific, it's avatar specific, which weaves impressively well with the idea of builds, the soul of souls that every character handles differently, but ultimately will find the tools to overcome obstacles. If you're like me, you only want to play offline. But I did summon at least once and tried overcoming my personal weirdness with online play. And so dipping into possible solutions is lionized. Getting help and being resourceful is 
elevated past the weird crabs in a bucket mentality of weird online community douchebags. You can freely transcend at your discretion, and it's uplifting in a way that only Elden Ring can be. There's no other game of this scope and variance in the FromSoft catalog, none that let you conquer the game and your own shortcomings in so many unique, meaningful ways. And while many endings exist, no doubt personally important or interesting ones if the player strays from expectation, most games end with the player unsurprisingly becoming the Elden Lord, going out into the world and getting the prize, finding the answers. It's not a perfect analogy and mostly useless because really, I'm applying a 40-year-old essay on old ideas about fantasy and fiction to a video game like any of this matters. All art is quite useless. Getting out of the meta-textual, the story's a fun romp about beating down a bunch of annoying has-beens to do what every Souls game already offered, recreating an age of mistakes top to bottom, or doing something to change the world. Either way, it's all on you. It's your game, and your fantasy. And that was Souls, a series often remembered for its difficulty but defined by its choice. I'm genuinely going to regret not spending more time with them. While games like Resident Evil 4 and other cropped adventures might make more obvious candidates for top 10 lists for their apparent design perfection, I appreciate the unhewn stone that Dark Souls and its spin-offs represent, something compelling by virtue of its resistance to newcomers, the roughness of its bumps and sharpness of its edges. They're willing to be funny and gamey and ridiculous all while presenting earnestly. Perfection is not a sustainable goal in design, and arguably nothing truly flawless is worth discussion. As I've said before, the Tetris fandom isn't exactly thriving. Souls came out raw and was rewarded with money and success, then spun out in fantastical new directions while maintaining the bases. From Bloodborne to Sekiro to Elden Ring, we see a series entrench its roots and flourish, literally warp the meta of modern era gaming. They're profoundly significant, both for the broader implications for gaming and for the players. Without being overly punishing or cruel, except perhaps for Sekiro and that's basically an art house game, they manage to convey the value of achievement. Many games are hard, but not many work with the world and the mechanics to deliver on that experience personally and meaningfully. If you happen to catch me on a rainy day, I'll be there, somewhere in the lands between, waiting for the call. Hey, it's K-Bash. Huge thanks goes out to my $4 patrons. Check them out. Beautiful. And double special thanks goes to my extra generous patrons who are... Adam Welch, Acropolis, Alex, Alpha, 42, Arch, Azura, Axin, Azuas, Bear Skeleton, Basement Dweller, Bearkeeper, BZ Soul, Ben M, Bing Bing Doo Doo, Oingo Boingo Time, Blake Against the Machine, Boa, Boom Dead, Brios, Brianna Wu, British Gooch, Cal, Can I Cuss on Captain Here, Blasted, Captain Wade, C Dub, Caesar T, Chiefy Boy, Cordon, Chris Bromo, Cody Golden, Couch Mobile, Corgi the Lad, Crater, Chrono 19D, CW Glassworks, Cynical, Daddy Dago, Dondio, Danny Pango, Dakota Storm Jones, Sweaty David Man. Castillo, Dara, Dakota, De Dennis Samaya, Diablo, Dingus Bat, Doug Prince, Dr. Cullen, PhD, DSChabano.com, D. Terry M, Dylan Coffee, 8 Bit Thunk, Elias, Elpio, Elsa, Emperor Pickle, Aesthetico, Everstone Isle, Exa, Fupa Saiyan, Frankenstein, Frisky Nippler, Glyph Seeker, 6112, Gray, The Darkest Black, Gargory, Gucci Black, Asi Ibrahim Tanyurga, Hatsune Miku's Crack House, Arkosh, Demon, Game and Station, X-Men, Horn Tiger, Huey, I'm supporting K-Bash just because I wanted to make this part of the video longer. Ingenious Cloud. I punched a sandwich. Irrational. Irradiated cherries. Dice Kyle. It's not bad. It's time to sue. It's not Why? good. Ivy Ruth Langley. Jacob. James. Jason Lasky. Jaden. Jay Dayas. JK Hedgehog. John Paul the Joker. Joke Frog. Jordan Joyner. Julian My Julian. Keegan Too Cool. Kata Snack. King Kuma. Clock Crating. Crazy Dark Chocolate. Kumi. Heist. Kyle. KZ Excellent. Ladies and Talion. Laundry Mom. Lego Sid. Little Big Trouble. Loadsome Dung Eater. Warren. Low Fat Mogu. Lucas Boy. Lucky Mix Smug Mac James Magical Madman Mara Ganger Hercules Mugio, Maximilian Wolfgang Nyberg Mike DeVere Mookie Moo Official Monochrome Only Modi Mr. Dodongo Mr. Whiskey 282 Nyra New Nito Torpedo Nico Puzzle Rat Nurian Deridius Not Nobel Old Burgle Old Man Cranberry Omni Nerd Zero Omni LK Kaplant Pandemic Cowboy Vignata PK Gaming Pontus Redding Popular Hitman Potato Gaming HD Prismatic Dan Proctal and Pals Quizer McDougal Quillwork Quinn Reasonable Willow Reggie Rodriguez Renteca Bond Ricochet Ray Friend Relay, Ray Londo, Ryan Mori Brooks, Siren Smells Good, Salty Smash, Scribe Slendy, Sakai Noorda, Shinigami, Silver Bear, 909, Sing 
god! Sleepy Wabbit. Suck em Bopper. Suck Dollager. Space Lizard. Spooky Grimalkin. Squidget. Squishward. Storm Strider. Streetums. The Blind Cataclysm. Super Sandwich Guy. Harvold's Quest. Shorn Chubbing The Big Bubby. The Clown Prince of Cringe. The Good Lord has blessed me. Hallelujah! The Green Loki. The Peacemaker Pyro. The Salt Knight. The Dick Mystic. Drips Heart Trap. Tiggles McGuffin. Timid the Rider. Turtle Play. Travis Edwards. Twiddle Chung. Ty Guy 9001. Vid. Valen Red. Venom. Vice Puck. Viewers like you. Waposa. We Trash. Wayland. Where am I? Widgie. Winter Solstice. Wood TV. Zanny Tanner. Yashi Chi. Yay Kundo. Zachary Livesey. Zachary Z. Zanasso. Zane the Impure. Zane the Pure. Zed Slayer Gamer. Zero Salazar. Silvlin Ray. Zenova. Cyberpunk. If you'd like to help support the show, unlock new long-form projects, and help me keep improving, check out my Patreon. We got lots more videos in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash